Why, what, what has happened? I mean, you know they would never hire a big-eared politician from Illinois. <laughs> well, I don't know if women have the vote now. Uh, I know that Frederick Douglass came to me at the White House in 1862 before the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And he said, Lincoln, you have to use colored troops. I said, no, Frederick. I said, the South has put out an edict that says you don't send a black man in uniform down here. If our slaves see him with that gleaming bayonet and the brass buttons, they're likely to get so excited they'll rise up and mutiny, kill their owners, so they can follow that army north. So we're telling you to avoid that, don't send any black troops here. If you do, and we capture them, they don't go to prison. They go to the firing squad or they go to the depths of the Gulf where they'll be put in slavery and you'll never see them again. So I said, I don't want to do it, Frederick. He said, well, Mr. Lincoln, when did the African slave trade end? I said, 1808. Well, he said, here in 1862, I don't think that these young men who want to go were born in Africa. They were born here. They don't want to call Africa home, they want to call America home. And they know this is their war, and they deserve the right to fight in it. And by fighting in it, they will show others they deserve the right of citizenship, and with citizenship comes the right to vote. So little by little, the government moves, and maybe that will lead along to your answer. And to answer from my viewpoint of politics in the state of Illinois, <laughs> As a proud Illinois politician, I am embarrassed. But most of all, I have much better hair than the former governor. Well, I think he's clearly defining not any one person from Illinois, but how the state has been run. So both of us have some issue there. <laughs> Time for three or four more back there. Mr. Lincoln, to what extent is slavery exist in your wife's side of the family? Well, there's no doubt that uh, Mr. Todd had six house servants, which were really slaves there in Lexington, Kentucky. But see, Mary broke away from that when she was 19. She did not get along <coughs> with her stepmother, and her sister, who had married the governor of Illinois' son, found out about that difficult relationship, so they invited her to come live there. So that's how Stephen and I would have met Mary Todd. But the idea is she had broken away from slavery and saw how dehumanizing it was. So she didn't line up on the camp of, of slavery protection at all. Douglas, I think you were born in Vermont, that right? That is, Brandon, Vermont. Andrew Jackson. <coughs> After my father passed away, I didn't feel wanted in the East, and I knew I needed to move on. And I ended up in Jacksonville, Illinois. I was an itinerant teacher. I did anything. I built cabinets, built bureaus, and got into government. Uh, right here. <clears throat> Including me. You thought that as well. And uh, <clears throat> what were some of the ways you attempted to raise morale at that time? I know a lot of those people were very frustrated by how long it was going. Well, the length of the war surprised so many people. 31 million people in the country, 20 million in the north, 11 in the south, and all the industry really in the north. But it was the leadership on the field of battle that was making the war prolonged. So after Fort Sumter was fired on, I called for 75,000 troops. But then we saw the leadership of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson at a little place right outside of Washington City called Manassas. And we knew it was going to be a longer war. And as you called for more troops, 300,000 at a time, the glamour of it all wore off. And where the enlistments were so great at the beginning, the camps were overflowing. But when they saw that some fellas didn't come home, 
except in a box, or that they came home with an eye gone or an arm gone. The glamour wore off of that, and we had to start conscription. Davis had to start it five months before I did, but we had to turn to that. And so you had to hope that the morale would keep up. You had to visit with the soldiers themselves and tell them what they were fighting for uh, was the thing that would be the guarantee of a country preserved with freedom and liberty for their offspring to the latest generation. There was a young hand back here. Yes. Oh, no, right, right here. This boy right here? Yeah. Who was my favorite president? I would think Washington beyond a doubt. When I read as a boy about what Washington did, how his enduring after Brandywine, September the 11th, a horrible loss that he had in 1777 to the British, and he was almost annihilated. And yet he endured Valley Forge, he came back and he won. And then he could have gone back to Mount Vernon and enjoyed a life of leisure and the country called upon him to be its political leader for eight years. So to me, Washington was always number one because of what he did for his country and how he was unselfish. He gave of himself to his great country. Oh, if I would have been an advocate for slavery, I could have probably masked being an advocate for slavery when in 1850, this man proposed slavery expansion by bringing it into the territories, what he called popular sovereignty. Huh. I, I was making pretty good money. I was a lawyer. I was held on retainer by the Illinois Central Railroad. I could have kept right in my office. But it's what tells you that there is right and wrong. And we were about to extend a wrong. So that drew me out of my office. So in reality, we know how much I hated it and how much I knew that we could only work at it within the confines of the Constitution. This upset a lot of people, a lot of abolitionists. They thought I wasn't quick enough. But I, if I had been an advocate of slavery, I never would have had to expose it. He would have taken care of that for me because all I would have had to do when a bad thing came along was sit and say nothing and let it get large. I see over o here. Over, uh, over there? Yes. I will say my first wife, Martha, we received as a wedding gift a plantation, and it was put in her name. I then, when my wife, Martha, died early, uh, a childbirth with our third child, and I remarried to Adele, uh, as a plantation was put in Adele's name. There were plantations that I stayed away from. However, they were in our family name, but never with my name on the deed. 